I know we focus a lot on the first few verses of this book, 2 Timothy chapter 3. And Paul, writing to Timothy, my Bible aside margin says, marks of the latter days. Uh, another translation says, the godlessness in the last days. And I am, uh, I believe God uses our personal experiences when he proves himself to us. How many has God ever proved himself to you? Nine, nine. I think every one of us could raise our hands. The reality of his presence, the reality of his provision, his spirit, his mercy, his love. There's so many words that you can describe and say that uh, I don't know about you, but there's no doubt in my mind that God is real That's right. and that he's alive and well. Because I know where I've come from. I know what I used to be before Brother Kevin, he got a hold of my life. Amen. And those experiences that um, as he walks with us and, and directs us, I wish it was easier. I wish it was easier to submit myself, Sister Pat, totally to him, to the workings of his hands. Uh, I wish sometimes my mind didn't try to figure him out or figure out what he's trying to do. And uh, I'm learning, praise God. I'm glad that he's gracious to me and merciful to me, Sister Sue. Uh, but he is working in, a, in such a way that we are going to be prepared if we want to be. We are going to be prepared for end time. Not only revival and harvest, but for end time judgment. And uh, he's really working on trying to get the church's mindset out of, out of our traditions, out of our, the commonality of how we function as believers, uh, both in church and out of church. I think there's so many things that we focus on that really have no bearing on the direction that he is going to send us relative to end time events. And when I read the things like, I remember when I first came to the faith and I read 2 Timothy chapter 3, even at that time, to a slight degree, it was like picking up the newspaper and reading it. But it just proves to me one more time that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. Matter of fact, if you just look at verse 16 with me for a moment, 2 Timothy 3.16, you probably could quote it. But the Bible says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. The Word of God in the English uh, Standard Translation says all scripture, all scripture is breathed out by God. I posted something today on Facebook that when we deny, when we make excuses and, and deny the authenticity of Scripture, we are denying the fact that God can breathe life into us. He can breathe life into our soul. He can breathe life into our thinking. Every aspect of us, He has the ability to change. He has the ability to communicate to us. And it says it, it's profitable for teaching, for uh, reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. And of course it says that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. There's a completeness in our relationship with God. The King James says the man of God may be perfect. Uh, that's uh, fully matured or fully developed. And even though Paul was writing to his son in the Lord, Timothy, who was, I believe, the pastor of the church in Ephesus, 
it's, it's applicable to you and I. The Word of God is designed to equip us. That's why it is so critical. That's why it is so important. People that don't read the Word of God, don't study the Word of God, don't dig in to find out the meanings and, and uh, look at the original language relative to uh, what the Word of God has to say, uh, the more you dig, uh, maybe just me, the more you dig, the more you find. And uh, it's not just a book to read. It's a book to apply, to read, to apply, to dissect, to how the prophets say something to the effect of he, he ate the scrolls, he ate the Word of God. And so as I, I've been thinking of this chapter, and uh, we'll just start at verse 1 of uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, where he says, But understand this, this know also, that in the last days perilous times, Perilous times, times of difficulty are going to come. Um, in First Timothy chapter four, verse one, it says, "Now the Spirit expressly says that in latter times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teaching of demons." Some folks don't believe the devil's real. Some folks don't believe that, that uh, he is a, a adversary uh, to contend with. But Paul said that the, there was going to be difficult times coming. There were going to be perilous times coming. And the reason why is because man has rejected God. Man has looked to himself for the answers of life. Man has looked to his intellect and, uh, and everything that he is in regards to solving the world's problems these politicians really amaze me. They think they really think that they're going to solve uh, the, poli the, the you know the, the crises of the world, and they sink millions and billions and billions of dollars. When I think of the amount of money they put into the educational system, and then I look at the educational system, or the the uh, you know the uh, other funds that they they drop into uh, different areas. And, and everything stays the same and because the deceivers are deceiving the deceived the deceived have no clue and they don't even see it and they don't even recognize it that tells me that when you deny God and reject God there's only one course that you're going to go one direction that you're going to go and you're going to go down yes, sir. That is, that's a fact Amen. and uh Paul says in verse 2, men shall be lovers of their own selves. Lovers of their own selves. Covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful and unholy. And we see the, the arrogance. We see the uh, abuse. You put somebody in a room and all they hear is constant uh, badgering and, and ugliness and, and hatred and and, and cutting down and just you put somebody in that atmosphere it is going to wear you down it would wear anybody down yes, sir. even those of us that have the holy ghost we would really have to capture our thoughts and bring our bodies under submission to the spirit of god because i think we're all being influenced even as believers surrounded in this world of the, the negative atmosphere it, it, it has so permeated our culture I thank God we've got word. I thank God we've got the Holy Ghost. We've got his peace. We've got a resource, if you please, to escape, maybe not physically, but to escape mentally and to escape within our heart some of the things that Paul talks about in these, uh, in these few verses of Scripture. Verse 3, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent or uh, unable to control their their passions is one one w way without self-control they would be brutal fierce despisers of those that are good and uh, the scripture goes on to say in verse 4 that they would be tra uh, traitors treacherous reckless swollen in conceit lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God and then verse 5 gives us, uh, I'm going to read you this in the Passion Translation, verse 5. The uh, King James says, lovers of pleasure more than having a form of godliness, 
Verse 5 in the Passion Translation says, They may pretend to have a respect for God, but in reality, they want nothing to do with God's power. And what does Paul end that verse with? Verse 5. Stay away from, from such people. From such people, stay away. You know, there's a time to separate ourselves, if I can say it that way. There's a time that we, uh, we do our best to, uh, like the Bible says, follow peace with all men. Uh, we do our best to try to accommodate that and, and truly follow peace with the people that, that surround us. But there also comes a time where you just need to walk away. Whether it's uh, in friendship or relationship or, or whatever, uh, there's times where, where you'd be better off just, just leaving. And there's, there's little injections of instruction in the Word of God that, that, uh, that talk about that, that tell us what to do. And our society has made it such, I was listening uh, to something the other day and how they're, they want to eliminate the SAT scores. I may have mentioned this uh, Sunday. They want to eliminate the SAT test and they want to uh, <clears throat> eliminate the A's, the B's, the C's, the D's, and the F's on report cards. And uh, because uh, everybody needs to have an opportunity, everybody needs to have a chance, everybody that uh, needs to be equal. And so we, we've taken, taken basic human structure um, it's just mind-boggling to me. To me, it's just common sense issues, but we've removed that from culture and society, uh, and we've replaced it with humanistic thinking. And I believe this is the whole plan. In order for there to be a, 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 a one-world religious system, man is going to exalt himself as God. The Antichrist is going to put himself in the temple in Jerusalem, and he's going to declare that he's God. Well, he's going to declare that he's God and everybody around him in our culture. You see, if there's no moral absolutes, you don't have to worry about hell. If there's no right and wrong, you don't have to worry about going to hell for, for disobeying God's law. And they think that by eliminating the word of God or the, or the law of God, or if they, they think they're eliminating good and evil, then they think that they're going to escape the judgment of God. But of course, we know that not to be true. The fact that the Bible says, be not weary in well-doing, means that the times are going to challenge us to cause us weariness mm -hmm. in well-doing. Mm -hmm. But it says, be not weary in well-doing. And if we're, we don't, uh, I know Luke 18, uh, Jesus starts the parable by telling, don't lose heart. He uses the phrase, King James phrase, don't, don't faint which means lose heart. And we're in times right now where it is very easy, if you allow it to, to lose heart, to get weary, to get, oh, I'm just tired of this. Oh, I don't know. And we really can't do that. And when the scripture says, if, if, we, if we sow to our flesh, we will of the flesh reap corruption, it's exactly what takes place when we allow things to get inside of us, uh, whether it be in our mind or our hearing. Uh, there is so much spiritual activity all around us. Satan knows he has a short time and he is working overtime to try to destroy as many as he can. The Bible says there's going to be a great falling away. I don't want to be amongst those that are, that, that portion of... And it's easy for you and I to sit here because uh, quite frankly, we're in a peaceful environment right now and kind of drop our guard and feel, well, no, that would never happen to me. I would never, you know, I would never grow. I would never walk away from God or, well, Satan is slick. He doesn't just come on head on many times. He's just like that proverbial pebble in the shoe, just a little bit, a little bit, just a little bit to chip away here and chip away here. And friend, he knows how to get in your mind and God's voice should be as loud as loud can be in, in all of our lives to understand that this godlessness of the last days is shift is sifting the whole world is being sifted. They're either going to decide for themselves to be themselves or they're going to surrender to God. I believe before it's all over, 
God is going to cause it to be so dark and so miserable and so frightening in, in, in the earth that people are going to then call upon him and look to him. And the reason why he's going to do that is because he loves them and he's not willing that any should perish. He doesn't want anybody go, to go to hell. Nobody. But then Paul turns from verse 5 of 2 Timothy 3. He says, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins led away with diverse lusts. English Standard says, For among them are those who creep into households and, and capture weak women burdened with sins and led astray by various passions. It's amazing when you read things like this and you read Romans chapter 1, usually the, the God uh, are they change, as he says, the glory of God into uh, images of four-footed beasts and creeping things and so on and so forth. And man's worshiping a whole lot of stuff in this hour that we're living in, thinking that he is going to produce this euphoria, this this la la land where everybody's going to be equal. And uh, I tell you what, the Great Reset is in fact in full swing and in full force. And I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that there is a scripture in the Bible that talks about a loaf of bread being worth a day's wage. I heard some of you talking about the 399 gallon gasoline. You see, we're in the last of the last days, and the manifestation of sin, corruption, the imagination of man's heart is evil continually, and this is the results that we have. And you can't have your own opinion. You, you can't think differently. You can't be differently. The intimidation factor of our culture today is so strong and so rampant. Everybody believes the same thing or everybody is afraid and everybody is afraid to express a different opinion about what the latest words or uh, whatever it is that's be the narrative that's being proclaimed. And he goes on, he, he, he just describes it to us of how this is going to unfold. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, you know, because sin abounds, the love of many would wax cold. Uh, the, the spirit of iniquity is at, at work. And, and I thank God that, that where sin abounds, grace does much more ground about we're recipients of grace. But I, I'm convinced, and, and just I'll just base it on my own experience, the grace that kept me back there isn't strong enough to keep me here. You understand what I'm saying? We need the grace of God like we've never, never. We need to be so dependent on the grace of God. There's no way we want to do this by ourselves. There's no way we want to say to ourselves, Oh, I got this. I got this. No, you don't have it. If that's your mindset, the scripture says, Beware when you think you stand, least you fall. And individuals that are, don't have that constant shield of faith in their hand and that constant word as a lamp and a light and they're, they're standing it with the peace of God, their, their, their battleground, if you please, is, is standing on the, the word of truth, the word of God. Uh, they're in for a big surprise. And those are the individuals that are going to fall away when this thing really begins to take shape relative to God's plan of judgment upon mankind, upon this nation. We've heard the prophecy and the nations of the world. Everything is going to fall into place. You know, you think, well, I would never, believers, well, I would never uh, submit myself to a mark. You know, when they came out with the COVID needle, it was, oh, uh, that's 666, you know, there's some chip in there and they're going to do this and they're going to inject it in us. And, and there was a big to-do. 
So when people hear about Revelations 13 and the 666 and, 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 and they come out with this needle they're going to force you to take and oh, yeah, I, I saw Bill Gates' movie, uh, movie and his documentary on how they want to control this and change mankind's DNA and everybody's flipping out about it. But the rest of the book, they don't pay attention to it. But it proved to me how easy it will be for the Antichrist to bring this system into play and force people they won't be able to buy, they won't be able to sell, they won't be able to live life in any economic way, shape, or form. So don't stand there and say, oh, no way, I wouldn't take that mark. Because there are believers right now that are on federal on the federal system and they've had the choice to either lose their possibly six figure a year job by not getting vaccinated or you get vaccinated and everything will be fine. So everything happens for a reason and it just amazes me how God shows that to us. How He has spelled it out for us. That we can know He he shows us and then but if I'm going to approach I don't believe we're going to be I believe we're going to be raptured before uh, some of this goes down but if I'm going to approach that uh, that event I'm I'm not going to, I'm not going to want to approach that event blindly I'm going to want to approach that event with understanding and that's why we pray for wisdom God give me wisdom to navigate these times give me the strength that I need that when compromise is at my door, I got enough Holy Ghost in me and enough trust and confidence in you that I can say no to that compromise. And whatever the cost may be, I'm going to trust that you're going to be there with me. You're going to help me and you're going to bless me. I mean, has he not done it now in, in any of our lives? Mm -hmm. Where compromise, you had a choice to either do this or do that, and you choose to follow the Lord, and he opened the door for a better job, or he opened the door for this situation or that situation. He's not going to change when we get down into the, into the deeper. He's looking at our faithfulness now. He's looking at our commitment now. Verse 7, notice what it says, ever learning. Ever learning. Always learning. And it just amazes me as I, I look through here that uh, people that uh, are, are never able to come to a place where they uh, arrive. They're <coughs> constantly, all the talking heads say, well, this is what you're going to do, and this is what you're going to do, and this is what we're going to do, and this is what we're going to do, and then we're going to do this. And, well, we think this is the best route to take. But they never ever come to a place, never come to the knowledge of truth, not only in, in uh, spiritual things, but also in the natural things. Even, even the Bible talks about um, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says, uh, First of all, then I urge that supplication, prayers, intercession, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way this is good and it's pleasing in the sight of god our savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth to think that god wants people to come to the knowledge of the truth he wants them to to, to understand and know and uh, again i'll fall right back to uh, there's got to be a manifestation of supernatural power of god in order for people to be convinced that the things that we tell them or the word tells them and we pray, God, confirm your word. Let your spirit confirm your word. Let the spirit confirm the word that I speak to people so that their confidence would not be in me, but their confidence would be in him. And that's where he wants to take us. That's why, that's why he's developing our hearing. That's why he's driving it home into our spirits. I want to use you, my power. The super, I'm opening the supernatural. You just have to have faith. Already told us, not everybody's going to believe it, but that's all right. Uh, don't let what you see in the natural affect your spiritual eyes. And Brother Allen, that's what he's doing with us. I don't want to be the same as I was yesterday. And I hope you feel that way too. 
I, ho I hope you feel that. I'm, I'm not satisfied with who I am in Jesus, and I'm going to do what I've got to do in order to get closer to Him, in order to know Him better. Praise God. Walk with Him closely. Verse 8, he gives the example. If you turn with me to Exodus chapter 7 and verse 11, it talks about, it uses the name of, of Janus and Jambres. These were the musicians, Exodus chapter 11. Uh, I probably have to go back. Um, well, let's pick it up at verse 10. Exodus seven ten. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers. I believe these were demonically led uh, individuals, whether they were, some translations call them magicians, but they were sorcerers. They were demonically influenced. And they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. Can you imagine that? You know, you're a man of God and you take your staff because this is what God told you to do. And you throw it on the ground and it turns into a stake. And then a couple of other guys that are not on your side come along and they take their, their staff and they say, oh yeah, that's no big deal. And they throw their staff down and their staff turns into snakes. I talk about faith being tested. But the Bible says what? The snake ate the other one. The snake ate the other one. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents, but Aaron's staff swallowed up their staff. Still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. So Paul uses that example in 2 Timothy 3 and 8. He says, Now Genez and Jambres withstood Moses. See, there was, there was with resistance there. He, he, they withstood Moses. People aren't, not everybody's going to be receptive to what we have to say. Not everybody's going to be receptive to your lifestyle. Not everybody's going to be receptive to uh, the way you feel about things. And that's all right. That's their business. Our business is to pray that God would give them the opportunity to make a choice. The next time you get bummed out because nobody wants to hear your witness or nobody's responding to your invitation, you need to pray, God... Give that individual the opportunity to choose. You see, when you look at it from that perspective, you're praying that God gives them the opportunity to choose. Whether they choose or not has no bearing on me at all. Right. It's up to them. Right. If they don't choose, so be it. But the point being in the scripture here, that there was resistance to what Moses was trying to do. And the devil just didn't lay down and die. God had hardened Pharaoh's heart, but uh, there was some, there was some uh, I can imagine how challenging as a human being, how challenging it might have been for Aaron and Moses. Well, we've got to go back before Pharaoh again. Wonder what kind of, wonder how this round's going to turn out. But that's exactly what happens when you're in warfare, especially hand to hand combat or, or any kind of close contact combat. There's resistance, there's, there's wrestling at times. Even sometimes you might get hit. But God has promised us victory. We have a shield. We have a sword. We have the word. You want to make sure you're covered. You want to make sure there's no, no uh, cracks in your armor that the adversary can, can come in. But plan on being withstood. Plan on meeting resistance because it's a natural fact of warfare. They withstood Moses, so do these also, people he's talking about. These last day marked believers, they resist the truth. They're individuals that are of corrupt minds and they're reprobate concerning the faith. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. They will not get very far, for their folly will be plain to all, as was of those two men. They shall proceed no further, the King James says in verse 9, for their folly shall be manifest unto all 
as theirs was also. Payday is going to come, folks. Yes, sir. Payday is going to come, both for us and for them. Or I should say for the world, for the world that is part of the prophecies of these scriptures, the godless society that we're surrounded by. Verse 10, he says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Oh, the list keeps going. Persecutions, afflictions, which came to be at Antioch, came to him at Iconium, came to him at Lystra. Well, you know, Brother Horn, he was—he I mean, wrote 14 books of the, of the uh, New Testament. You know, of course, that I mean, everybody was out to get him. But the point being, as he ends verse 11 by saying, "Out of them," he, first he says, "I endured," but out of them all what's it say the Lord delivered me the Lord delivered me out of them all that's what we stand upon passion translation says but you Timothy have closely followed my example and the truth that I've imparted to you you have modeled your life after the love and endurance I've demonstrated in my ministry by not giving up the faith I have you now have what I have hungered for in life has now become your longing as well. The patience I have with others you now demonstrate and the same persecutions and difficulties I have endured you have also endured. Yes, you know all about what I had suffered while in Antioch, Iconium, Lystra. You're aware of all the persecution I endured there. Yet the Lord delivered me from every single one of them. For all who choose, verse 12, for all who choose to live godly as worshipers of Jesus, the anointed one, will also experience persecution. We don't like that. But it comes with the package. And if you happen to be a type of individual that is concerned with what people think about you and what people say about you if you're intimidated where you feel you can't be yourself who you are uh, and you're, you you hold back from being the expressive person that you are or just who you are you're going to have a real hard time in the last days being a believer of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because it's that that very spirit, attitude that will cause you to cower when you're being persecuted. Yes, he said, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution verse 13 but evil men evil men and sorcerers will progress from bad to worse deceived and deceiving as they lead per people further from the truth see we haven't seen nothing yet this is th this is just the this is just the, the, the batter in the mixing bowl. Hasn't been thrown into the oven yet to pr really produce what's coming down the pipe. And so, we stay on solid ground now. We stay on a rock now. And as these winds blow and that winds blow and then the hurricanes start to pick up and, and who knows? When God begins to pour judgment upon the United States and the world, He may use that very opportunity to take us home. I wouldn't mind that. I mean, I plan on going to heaven anyway. How about you? 
But these are the things that we think of. These are the things that we talk about. These are the, these are the reflective things of the Word of God that we need to understand that in the same way God has met our needs, heard our prayers, manifested His presence, uh, spoken to us through the Word, effectively uh, uh, done surgery in here and created in us a clean heart and, and given us a new mindset in that same way that all that is real, relative, and manifest, this is also the real, relative, and manifest. And I need to understand and you need to understand that this is where I'm headed. Yeah. I'm not going to lose sleep over it. <coughs> Jesus said, take no thought for tomorrow. So None of us know what tomorrow is going to bring in, in, our, in our day and in our life. So it's one day at a time. That's it. And we address it as the day approaches. Uh, no matter how much sleep I may lose thinking about what i got to go through or what's going to happen tomorrow, whatever. It really, the only benefit I got was being tired and exhausted the next day. Yep. So if I can use the Word of God and the Spirit of God... Uh, to to capture my thought process and just say, Lord, I'm going to receive your peace during this and whatever. You know, you find your own secret place. I hope you have one. Uh, abide in, in, in under the shadow of the Almighty God and that same peace that you have when everything's going well and doesn't seem to be any pressure or any stress in your life, you should be able to walk with that same kind of peace day in and day out. It's all, oh, yeah, that's impossible. It's not impossible. It takes work. It takes effort. It takes diligence to, to say, no, I'm not going to allow my spirit to get all riled up over this. I'm not going to allow my mind to get me upset or whatever and, and do everything that I need to do using the resources that he's given me to be able to say, Jesus, you said you would give me peace. And we stand on it. Evil men and seducers will, shall wax worse and worse. Then in verse 14, as we close tonight, verse 14. But continue thou in the things, here it is. Continue thou in the things which thou has learned and has been Assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Isn't that a powerful verse? Think about that. What he's saying there. Let me read it to you in the Amplified Translation. Amplified says, But as for you, continue to hold to the things that you have learned and of which you are convinced, knowing from whom you learned them. Stand with me if you would tonight. The only way you can be assured of something is to experience something. I mean, I can tell you things, you can tell me things, and we might believe it. We might have doubts about it. We might say we believe it, but we might not even understand it. But the only way I can have assurance is if what's being told to me is factual. I've experienced it. I know beyond a shadow of a doubt type of thing. And so this is why we go through what we go through. This is why every one of our journey is not the same. Our lives are all differently. We deal, God uses different aspects of each and every one of our lives individually. Even if you're a husband and wife, individually. He uses our different aspects of life to grow that assurance inside of us. Because it's the only way, it's the only way. How do you continue in something that you've learned and been assured of if you never experience it? Unless you find yourself in a place where you need deliverance, you're never going to be assured that God can deliver you. If you never find yourself in a, in a place of warfare and God said, I'll fight your battles for you, you wouldn't be assured that he could and will, in fact, fight the battle 
until your, your assurance is such where you're able to, to release what he puts inside of you, how he speaks through you, however and whatever he uses, whether he sends an angel to fight for you or whether the Holy Ghost inside rises up and you begin to, to battle in, in a warfare tongue and, uh, and God speaks against the spirits that come in against you, whatever, whatever he decides to use, you'll eventually get to a place where I, I'm pretty assured, I've, I've got the assurance that I can walk through the valley of the shadow of death and I don't have to fear any evil because he's with me. I know he's with me. He's proved it over and over and over again. I've got the assurance. The church is going to be standing, friend. The church is going to be standing. Even if this building was to burn down to the ground and we were to lose all every penny asset of, of, our, of our structure, of our assembly, the church would still exist. Yes, you know why? Because we're the church. Yes, Praise God. Yes. Hallelujah. We're the yes. church. Thank you, it's never going to fail. It's never going to fall. Thank you, and so when we're going through those, those times of famine or those times of warfare or those... Times of uncertainty. The church still stands. Even if I get knocked down for whatever reason, I can still stand. Because whatever happens to me is ordained by Him. Everything that takes place in my life is ordained by Him. And, and when I question or you question or we get all flustered and all frustrated because we don't understand what's going on and how come this, how come that, we're, we're challenging God. We're saying to God, I don't understand why this is happening. Why don't you reverse that attitude and say, you know what, Jesus, find yourself some scriptures and start reading the book back to the Lord and say, this is what I believe, Lord. This is what you said. I don't have to feel this way, Father, because this is recorded. This is based on your character, God. This is what you told me about this. And I'm believing this. I don't, the devil's a liar, and I'm going to believe it. You say, that's crazy. Try it. I have assurance. I have a word from God. How about you? Praise God. Praise God. When all is said and done in the end, we win. Look at your neighbor. Tell them they win. Praise God. Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, we give you praise tonight and worship tonight. And just so thankful, so grateful for the promises that you've given to us. We stand tonight. We are complete in you, Father. We are complete in you. There is, there is nothing wrong with me, Father. I am complete in you. My righteousness is from you. My mind is from you. My spirit is from you. My steps are from you. Everything about me, Father, as a new creature in Christ Jesus, you said in your word that all things are passed away and all things have become new. I don't have to drag in my childhood into my current day existence. I don't have to drag in yesterday's troubles or yesterday's problems. I can live today. Now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. And I thank you, my God. I thank you, my God, that you love us enough to bring us to that place of assurance, Lord Jesus. That we know, O oh God, that your hand is strong and your ability to keep us, O oh God of heaven, and your ability to preserve us. We are walking evidence of the power and the spirit and the word of life. Thank you, Jesus. In you tonight we live. In you tonight we move. In you tonight we have our being. Everybody say amen. Praise God. You love him tonight. God bless you in Jesus' name.